Hello, my name's Alex Bainbridge. I'm with Green Left. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this latest episode of the Green Left Show. Uh, this is our video podcast. Whether you're watching this as a video or listening to it as a podcast, either way, uh, thank you for, for joining us today. We're here today with two guests, Sam Wainwright, who is a Socialist Alliance member of the Fremantle City Council, and uh, Vivian Porzoltz, who is an activist with Jewish Voices for Peace. And we'll be hearing more from Sam and Vivian in a moment. Before we get underway, I want to acknowledge that we are recording this video on stolen Aboriginal land. Uh, this is, uh, I'm coming to you from Jagera Turbul country, but wherever you are in the country, this is stolen land. Sovereignty was never ceded, and it's vital that we continue to, uh, to support ongoing struggles for justice for Aboriginal people. Uh, before we get underway, I'd also like to say that if you do like our work, please become a Green Left supporter. It's the most important way to support our work. Plans start from $5 a month and the first month is free. It's the best way to get both get Green Left and also to show support for our work. But even if you can't afford a cent, one thing you can do for free at the very least, whether you're watching this as a video or as a podcast, please give it a thumbs up and also please consider sharing this link. We do want to expand the audience. We want more people to 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 listen to the to the to the to the show, to the work that we're doing. Uh, Today, as I said, we're going to be speaking about the Labor Party and the Labor Party Special Policy Conference, which was concluded this week. Uh, I think the it's fair to say that the outcome of that policy conference is a watered down policy platform for the Labor Party. Just to give you a bit of an idea, the Guardian uh, commenting on the on the outcome said, well, what does all this mean? Well, you're going to be hearing a lot more about Labor values at the next election, but not necessarily policies. It's a slimmed down platform, which means it will be a slimmed down policy pool. It's going to be a lot more about the feel or the vibe rather than here is our answer for this. What did the Sydney Morning Herald say? The platform lacks definitive positions on hot button energy issues, including support for coal fired power, the role of gas in the energy mix and measures to further boost renewable energy. The party's national policy platform says it will not rule out new gas extraction and power projects in line with the Morrison government's policy. And Mr Bowen said last month gas power would remain critical to support growth in renewable energy. So that's it on climate. That's one of the big weaknesses of this uh, of this policy conference. They've weakened, the Labor Party has weakened their policy on, on climate change. They've abandoned 2030 targets. Another issue that was a, a perhaps a, I, I would say a controversy, but perhaps more better described as a manufactured controversy, uh, surrounded issues around Labor's uh, reaffirming their recognition or their proposal to recognise Palestinian statehood. But just in general, I think it's fair to say Labor has been disappointing the progressive side of politics. Uh, no one on the progressive side of politics would say they therefore prefer an LNP government. Um, we don't want to see uh, the Liberals continue in government. But the real question for progressives is that Labor is not offering enough. And if we want to see genuine change, we need to have a better policy than what Labor is offering. So we're going to be discussing uh, those things today, especially the climate policy and the, uh, the issues around Palestine and Israel. Uh, but before we get underway, I'd like to maybe ask Sam if you might introduce this topic by uh, telling us about the recent Western Australian state election. The results there were dramatic, historic even. And can you tell us your thoughts about this the state election and what this means for federal Labor? Sure. And uh, yeah, greetings to you and um, from, from Gwanyalap or Fremantle. Um, here in Wajuk Noongar country. Look, the, I think first and foremost, the state election in Western Australia was a referendum on COVID. Um, that would be the simplest way to describe it. We've seen right around the country that incumbent leaders um, have had quite high popularity uh, for their handling of COVID, which has genuinely been seen by the population to be you know, competent and necessary. Um, and so certainly the election also shows you know, support for strong support for public health measures that the population deems to be necessary. That's kind of overwhelming. So while there is a current of, you know, vaccine scepticism or uh, criticism that the measures to, to stop the spread of COVID have clamped down in, on our civil liberties, overwhelmingly, uh, people feel that the public health measures taken have been um, necessary and justified. Um, now, on one level, you could say that it reflects a fairly low level of expectation um, in politicians in Australia. I mean, if if these politicians who are being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars per year just do a, a competent job of, of handling a, a public health crisis, 
um, their popularity absolutely kind of skyrockets. Um, and, you know, it doesn't resolve any of the other things going on. Nonetheless, that, that's what the result reflected in Western Australia, I would say. And it was particularly sharp in Western Australia for a couple of reasons. First was in WA, um, I guess by chance, by luck, um, COVID was not, not very widespread by the time the true, you know, the, the true meaning and implication of it became apparent. And so imposing border closures um, was a fairly quick and easy thing. Uh, relatively painless uh, politically and economically that the state government here was able to do. And they proved to be very, very popular. Um, but at the same time, the Liberal Party misjudged this. You know, the, the Liberal Party, I guess they're sort of, um, oh no, you can't, you know, you can't impede um, free trade sort of impulse. I meant they initially imposed or questioned uh, the border closures imposed by um, Premier Mark McGowan. Um, they then did a 180 degree turn. And in the, in the course of that, their leader, Lisa Harvey resigned and had to be replaced by Zach Kirkup with you know with very short notice before the before the next state election and even more disastrously disastrously for the Liberals, their federal colleagues initially supported the uh, federal court action by Clive Palmer who challenged the legality of state border closures in the High Court. And not only did he lose, but the Liberals looked absolutely terrible. I mean, the federal Liberals ended up backtracking on that, but. Um, you know, and if you mix in a bit of WA parochialism into the issue, um, you know, people from over, a billionaire from over east trying to tell us what to do, threatening our health. Um, it was just an utter catastrophe for the Liberals and they just, they simply, simply never recovered. The other thing too, I'd say is that um, the, you know, with the, 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 the economic consequences of the shutdowns and that sort of thing, of course, were, were, were cushioned by by JobKeeper and the increase in JobSeeker. Um, now we know those things are being wound back. Um, and we might talk about the implications of that a bit later, but that they haven't yet really bitten. So that was that's that's some of the context for the um, of, of the state election, in my opinion. Um, one thing you can say for certain is that, it, and this you know harks back to the point you were making about fossil fuels and gas and that kind of thing. I mean, there is absolutely nothing to suggest that the McGowan government will not deviate from its absolute loyalty to the mining industry and the big fossil fuel um, companies, which has defined its last four years of government. OK, but what do you think all this means for the Federal Labor Party? Is this like just a purely state issue or, or, or what do you say about what this means for the Federal Labor Party? Well, I think I think it doesn't. Uh, it's. You know, all, all incumbent premiers, whether Labor or Liberal, have, have benefited from being seen to be very authoritative and, um, you know, on the, and you know, doing their job on COVID and, the, you know, the regular press conferences, that kind of thing. And, and Morrison has benefited from that as well. Um, probably not as much as the, as, as the premier. So I don't think it's, you know, accrued to the Morrison's benefit as much, but it still has accrued to, to, to Morrison's benefit. Um, and the fact that Morrison is still, you know, despite um, the just the sort of ongoing um, sort of scandal surrounding the absolute atrocious, you know, misogynistic behaviour um, in and around the Liberal Party and the federal parliament, and prior to that, the damning, you know, findings of the age, you know, the Royal Commission to, into Aged Care. I mean, Morrison's still sitting at fifty-five percent, you know, um, fifty-five to forty-five, I believe, as as preferred prime minister. So. It, that it, it shows that the Labor Party is is ha, has has struggled to cut through, and I don't think we can take it for granted at this point that that Labor will win the next federal election. I mean, certainly, I was I'm, I'm less confident that I, than I was at the beginning of the year that there will be an early federal election. Um, I mean, those those those, those two um, you know, major problems for 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 the, for the Liberal Party might have might have changed their calculation. Who knows? They might decide to go you know go early and limit the damage. Um, um, but the fact that they are now, you know, behind in the two two party preferred vote means they might, on the other hand, try to ride it out um, and, and 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 see if their fortunes change. Um, it's pretty clear that the at the national level, the Labor Party still has not managed to cut through. Um, and as you talked about it in your introduction, they're clearly not they they don't really want to use the um, the election campaign to to cut through with decisively different policies. Um, it's just going to be about the look and the vibe and being a bit more caring or appearing to be that sort of thing. Um, uh, with, with vague references to a, to a fairer Australia. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I think 
by, by, by sort of playing it safe, so as to speak, um, I, I think it might, um, you know, that, 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 might play, that might play to, to Morrison's advantage, but it's probably still too early to say. I think uh, you might recall from the 2019 election, there was a certain current of argument that Labor was, quote unquote, too ambitious. I think you and I actually had a discussion about that at the time, uh, which is still up. You can still see it on the, on the Green Left side as well. Uh, we'll put a link below. Um, would you say that's the, the outcomes of this uh, policy conference are a reflection of that viewpoint? Well, I do, yes. So, I mean, and, and the, I mean, that's reflected too in the way that the, there's obviously a lot of effort went beyond, behind, on behind the scenes to, to, ins- to, to, to make the conference more of, a, of an election launch thing rather than a serious working conference. Where, where, where issues are debated out and, you know, differences are aired in public and all that kind of thing. So it was obviously a very clear effort trying to massage it into a, um, a presentable package um, be- before you even got to, the, got, got to the conference floor. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it, it's, um, you know, there's some vague state you know vague you know vague vague statements which which are general you know which which some of which are good you know in terms of um you know le- a le- lesson of lesson of the COVID experience is that the w- workers need security in the in, in 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 employment and we need to we need to halt the drift of casualization um we need to ensure that workers actually getting some of the, the gains of productivity that, that that australian capitalism has been making over the last few decades all that kind of thing but this but without specific policies to to mandate how that how that will happen, um, it, it, it's really all just a bit up in the air, isn't it? Um, and we know that once you know Labor gets into government, um, that that then gets strongly you know curbed or wound back or mediated by all the sort of pressure of the of, of the capitalist establishment, and the uh, and the same is even more true for the for the commitments around um, commitments around climate. So uh, it certainly isn't it certainly isn't the bold sort of um, uh, even modest but bold transformational sort of you know um, program that um, that we saw articulated by you know Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn that's for sure. And as and as and as such, of course, it then doesn't can't uh, resolve any of the fundamental contradictions that that Australian society is facing. I, I think we'll we'll bring uh, Vivian into this uh, conversation. I mean, the first day of the policy conference had a big focus on foreign policy. One of the issues that came out of that was the discussion about Palestine and Israel. Uh, There was a a certain controversy, a mini controversy perhaps, uh, former MP Michael Danby, who is very much associated with the right wing of the party, but even more so associated as a strong uh, Zionist, uh, claimed that he was censored uh, because he wasn't allowed to speak. Um, That really was only the the Murdoch media that sort of gave that Oxygen, although, for example, Samantha Maiden, the uh, journalist who has heroically exposed some of the uh, sexism and misogyny in Parliament, was also, uh, you know, amplifying that view. Uh, do you want to talk any about the, the some of the issues surrounding that? Well, you know, as I stand at the the amendment which he was supposed to speak to was cancelled and uh, was withdrawn, and therefore there's nothing for him to speak about. And so. As usual, people like him are raising a great gashrai and making out that, you know, he was censored and so on. They, they do this. They do this kind of, I'm afraid, this kind of misrepresentation of the situation very regularly and, um, and to, to represent themselves as a victim. And um, this is just more of the same. And, you know, Danby, of course, has sort of outworn his usefulness in the Labour Party. Uh, well, I guess related to that, the ALP conference has adopted an amendment which... Uh reaffirms their previous position that recogni- of recognising Palestinian statehood. Again, the usual suspects on the right wing are trying to make this out as a big uh, problem. But can you talk about um, Palestinian recognition of Palestinian statehood and also uh, the Labour claims of you know, being a true friend of Israel? Well, this is the issue, you see. Um, something like recognising the state of Palestine when you know the the whole question the whole question of two states is so much in in question um is is um might be seen as beside the point but i think giving that recognition just raises that level of legitimacy for palestine internationally it puts a sliver of daylight between the coalition and labor which i think politically is very useful and that they've affirmed it um, um it, it seems in a, in a strengthened kind of way um is really good um, and so they're hanging on to it. They're not getting nervous about that particular thing. 
And to say to the Zionists to be a true friend of Israel, we have to support a Palestinian state, at one level is quite a courageous statement. I mean, it's not in the, 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 um, the field of human rights where we um, engage, but in terms of where they engage, um, that's not too bad. So what, what, would, what do you think the Labour Party should be saying or doing in, in relation to Palestine and Israel? Well, I think they, they, you know, they've just got to be real. I mean, this sort of carrying on about the two states um, when it hasn't, you know, the, the just hasn't been real for so long. And, and looking at when you have Zionists, uh, you know, liberal, famous liberal Zionists like Peter Beinart saying, um, I, I no longer believe in a Jewish state and um, wanting simply dem- democratic rights um, throughout the land. Um, that's where the place is heading. When you get um, B'Tselem, the um, Israeli human rights organization, um, describing Israel, not just in the occupied territories, but also in Israel proper as an apartheid state. Um, there you have from the heart of Zionism, um, the, um, this kind of fundamental questioning. Uh, so can you maybe talk to us about some of this international context? I mean, like we've had the British Labour Party has been uh, rocked by uh, by this discussion about uh, anti-Semitism, which I think is fair to say is a is a bludgeon that's been used against the previous Jeremy Corbyn leadership. Uh, but it's 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 got echoes that are continuing today. Can you talk about some of that? Oh, this is really really important because I think this whole question of the way the charge of anti-Semitism is used as a club is not only about Israel Palestine. It's about, um, you know, uh, completely um, attacking the validity of the whole social political agenda that the Labour Party was standing for under Corbyn. It's the same thing affects the Greens here. They're accused of anti-Semitism because their kind of views are beyond the Murdoch pale. And um, so to, for, for that, uh, these, are, these are the more broad reasons for the attack. It's not just about Israel-Palestine. And the question um, of the use of anti-Semitism, we, you, we know about how the, um, the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, it's called a non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism, um, has been used by the Zionists to try and it includes all these examples which, um, um, you know, can't, can't be said. And the articles written by um, um, Beth Selem and by Peter Beinart would be declared anti-Semitic under that definition. And um, so in a sense, I think the this use, I won't say it's the IHRA definition itself because the IHRA had no such intention when they developed that definition. It was simply used to, for data gathering. It wasn't be, to be used in this highly politicized, weaponized way. And so um, the, the whole thing has become really quite out of hand and totally dishonest. Um, and, and what has happened since, there has been a, issued a, what's called a Jerusalem Declaration of, of, on Anti-Semitism, and this is in response, and there have been, you know, numbers of criticisms by the Palestinians that, you know, Palestinians weren't involved in the statement, that it was based in Jerusalem, but it was put out by the Van Leer Institute, I believe, in, in Jerusalem, um, but it does offer a very helpful political counter. Um, to, to the I, IHRA, so bodies that may be pressured to say something about anti-Semitism, say, well, look, we've got this one, we'll do this. But you see that one of the problems is that it's regarding treating anti-Semitism as something special, where it's, it's only one kind of rela- uh, racism, like, you know, um, Islamophobia and so on. And um, so, so, so the whole thing um, is problematic. I mean, one of the good things about the Jerusalem Declaration on anti-Semitism, it says, anti-Semitism, just another form of racism. It shouldn't be divorced from all of that and all the processes that go on to um, feed racism. And um, so it's, it's, it's an ongoing fight. I mean, just as um, the Zionist lobby frames the boycott divestment sanctions campaign for BDS as um, a way of um, delegitimizing Israel, in fact, the, this campaign using the site RA definition, um, in fact, you, is, a, is, a, is um, an answer to BDS to de- so to delegitimize the Palestinian um, voice and advocacy and silence it. That's the real problem with it. And it doesn't do much for 
um, genuine anti-Semitism or, uh, you know, in its, in its examples which it gives of anti-Semitism, this is the IHRA definition, um, it, it's, you know, they're, they're nothing about white supremacy. It's all about Israel-Palestine. So just about the IHR definition of anti-Semitism, perhaps you can help clarify for us. I mean, I, I, ha- there is, I understand there is a speech by Penny Wong where she says the ALP has, has adopted the IHR definition, but is, what's your understanding about that? Can you just clarify? Well, we in, in, yeah, well, we in Jews Against the Occupation were very concerned when we read that report. She gave it a, as a keynote speaker at a Zionist Federation function, and we wrote to her and to Tanya Plibersek raising our concerns and um, the, we then sought a meeting with Tanya Plibersek. And um, she was very open with us and said um, that it was not ALP policy um, to endorse the IHRA definition. And we, for instance, gave her as part of the material supporting our concerns, the analysis by Jeffrey Robertson, the Australian human rights lawyer, analyzing the IHRA statement and its problems from a legal use as a legal um, weapon and also um, from, from the point of view of dealing with real anti-Semitism. And a few moments ago, you mentioned about how this debate about the definition of anti-Semitism is actually obscures the real fight against anti-Semitism. Can you, can you talk about what that means in Australia today? Well, the attack of anti-Semitism against Corbyn and against the Greens is not only about, uh, about their position with Israel. This is why the Murdoch press and people beyond the Israel lobby have leapt on board because it's such a useful club to beat um, um, Corbyn and, and his followers in the, in the British Labour Party um, on their support for much more progressive policies. And similarly, um, with the questions of the Greens, the Greens are demonised by the Murdoch press um, for just those reasons. It's not just about Israel-Palestine, in my view. And I guess, can you explain to us like how, mu- how, much, of a, um, how much of an issue is anti-Semitism in Australia today? Oh, well, it is rising. I mean, there are issues, you know, graffitis and horrible things. And and there is, you know, in the common day-to-day sort of attitudes, it's a little layer there because it's a very deeply rooted thing in in, um, in European society. And um, But given what um, um, Muslims uh, have to tolerate, and um, it's not the same at all. And um, the Jewish community is much more established than it used to be and um, has much more, um, you know, weapons at its disposal. I mean, it has much more, has the ear of um, um, politicians in a way that the Muslims don't have. And of course, now we have Chinese as well, you see. I mean, the, in, the, in the white supremacist world, it's the Jews, it's the, um, the, the, the Chinese and, and the Muslims. Um, these are all objects. And, you know, the issue is, you know, the intersectionality. We've got to um, get together and not huddle away in our own private concern for anti-Semitism. So, I mean, you did say that anti-Semitism is on the rise. So what are the best things we could do in Australia today to sort of combat that? And especially, how do, I mean, how does that link in with broader struggles against racism? Well, I mean, there's the sort of common garden day-to-day stuff that provides the infrastructure. It's a bit parallel to issues of violence against women and sexism and harassment. Um, One has to deal with the day-to-day when someone makes a sexist remark or a racist remark, whether anti-Semitic or otherwise. You pick them up on it, but not necessarily in a cudgels drawn kind of way, but just say, hey there, that's enough. Um, you know, in a way that sort of doesn't sort of inflate the situation, but calls it. And so that um, people know this is not okay. And we've all got a responsibility at that level. And then, of course, then at the top level where uh, people have to, to model um, what, what is appropriate behaviour, which we're not getting particularly. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to labour this, but I mean, perhaps can you also just uh, talk to us about the about your support for BDS campaign in Australia today and, and the other work, the work of Jewish Voices for Peace? Well, I think like uh, everywhere, it's very hard to um, um, for Palestine to be high up on the agenda of even activists, I have to say, um, pretty hard. And so all the more important, so the, the few of us keep, keep it going and, um, and, you know, just engage people as we can. I mean, we do our weekly stalls for BDS in, in, in various parts of Sydney. And uh, this morning we were in Auburn and that was very pleasant. 
and during um, Ramadan, uh, the, we, we're focusing on not buying Israeli dates for Ramadan. And so we will be in uh, Lakemba once a week, uh, you know, after the uh, fast, um, along with the other people in the street, in Halden Street in Lakemba, um, and promoting BDS and reminding people not to buy Israeli goods. Okay, so thanks, Sam. Do you want to make any comments on these issues of Palestine and Israel that were raised at, at the ALP conference? Look, I think it shows that the Labor Party is trying to walk a walk a fine line here. On the one hand, um, you know, Labor is entirely loyal to its alliance with the United States, and and by implication, that includes the strategic place of Israel as a sort of a bulwark for for Western power in the, in, in the Middle East. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the situation has just got so miserable for the Palestinians, and there's just clearly no hope. Um, from the from the, of any kind of compromise um, coming from the, the the Israeli political establishment, um, that they have to be seen to throw the Palestine, Palestinians a bit of a bone, and I think that I mean that relates to Australia's strategic and sort of trade opportunities as well. Um, you know, we have to remember that sympathy for for the Palestinians is much deeper, you know, not just in in the Arab world and majority Muslim countries, but in 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 in, in the global South in general. So. Um, it's, you know, the Labor Party's got to uh, publicly be, be seen to differentiate itself at least somewhat from, from a sort of a Trump, you know, um, stuff them, you know, who cares if they all die kind of, kind of attitude um, and be seen to throw some little, you know, so there'd be some little light at the end of the tunnel for the Palestinians without really particularly committing to anything uh, in, in particular. And the other thing I'd say too, and this relates to the Labor Party sort of, uh, platform as a whole is even though there's some good bits and pieces in in the in the in the new labor party um policy document um okay we could say they need to go further or they're not strong enough or they're too vague or whatever um but the more fundamental problem is that under the labor party's practice the the, the parliamentary caucus is not bound um by, by that document you know it's free it's free it's free to implement the the, the document as it sees fit, according to its own timeline. So essentially, and that's all, that's the way the Labor Party has always been in every state and federally, the, the parliamentary caucus um, can just basically not implement the things it doesn't want to implement um, or implement the, way, implement the way they want to or and just put off the things they don't want to and so on. And so it, it always get, gets refracted through that prism, um, which is, always means that no matter how good the Labor Party policy is adopted at conference, um, the thoroughly, thoroughly pro-capitalist parliamentary caucus um, has, has, has power of veto over everything. Uh, and th in that sense, that's, you know, the Labor Party is notionally a democratic party, you know, unlike the Liberals. I mean, in the Liberal Party, it's quite clear. The parliamentary caucus is the leadership of the party. Um, now, in theory, the Labor Party is a membership organisation, both with, you know, affiliated memberships via the unions and individuals who are unions and you have state and federal conferences and they elect office bearers and elect the policy and, you know, create, you know, adopt the policy rather. And then the, par the parliamentarians are supposed to be, you know, the servants of the party who then impl implement that policy. But in the real world, the parliamentary caucus is the leadership. Um, and as I said, has a veto over, over everything anyway. And it's, um, as long as the Labor Party fun functions that way, um, um, you know, all, 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 all serious hope for major change is doomed, basically. Actually, staying on foreign policy just briefly, uh, I mean, I think China is a topic we'll have to take up uh, in more depth on another another occasion. Uh, but but China was the other foreign policy issue where which was which was prominent in the in the coverage at least of the Labor Party conference, and um, I think there were you know strong criticisms of the human rights abuses among the Uyghurs uh, in particular and other human rights criticisms of China. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, all socialists, except the most rusted on apologists for the Chinese regime, I think have got sympathy for, um, for the, for the, for the plight of the Uyghurs, which, is, you know, clearly it is the case that there are, there are manifest human rights abuses there. On the other hand, um, looking at it from real politic point of view, uh, this framing by the Labour Party does does fit in with the with the increasing imperialist tensions on China. Do you have any comments about that, Sam? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like the the United States, um, the U.S. establishment, um, but 
Democrat and Republican, and, and this is where Biden and Trump are united, um, have decided that they need to they need to box China in um, economically and militarily, um, and they're going to do it. And that, you know, and even if it causes you know some pain for themselves, um, they're going to do it now. And it's interesting that the Australian establishment, I mean, Australia has always been, you know, the, the most loyal um, sort of junior imperialist ally, you know, both of the British Empire and now of the sort of what you might call the Anglo imperialist network um, headed by the United States, but involving Australia and um, Canada as well. The so called Five Eyes countries. So, I mean, there is a tight, tight interconnection between those sort of majority English speaking. Uh, imperialist powers, and and that's not just a cultural thing. That's important to understand. There's a high high degree of interpenetration of of capital investment. You know, so the biggest foreign investors in Australia are not are not actually Chinese. Uh, they're British and American capitalists, and vice versa. Australian capital um, invests in the United States as well. So there's a strong material basis for it. You know, they're they're tight. They're they're tight. They're a tight unit, um, uh, tighter than they are with you know French or German capitalists, for instance. You know, who who have overlapping the slightly strategically different sort of interests. So it's been very tight, but of course, it, it's in some ways, it's a sharper contradiction for Australia because of the fact uh, that China is, but both the, you know, is the des is, is such a significant destination for our exports, not just our imports of manufactured goods, like it is for other, uh, for other countries, but for our exports as well. So, but, but it does seem like, um, from what I can tell anyway, is that the majority of Australian big business and with it, the, the establishment, and that includes the Liberal Party and Labor Party, even though it, you know, it means significant, might mean significant pain for, especially in the short to medium term, while they look for other markets, might might mean pain for you know agricultural exporters, um, you know, for Australian winemakers or you know lobster uh, fishermen or whatever it is, you know, they're prepared. They, they, it looks like they're prepared to r ride this out and go along with this um, contain China, contain China thing, and that's that's um, I mean, that's pretty frightening. They are um, they are sort of pushing pushing towards war. Um, whether cold or hot, I don't know. But that's, um, I think, in in that sense, you know, the Labor Party has demonstrated its 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 loyalty to ANZUS once again. All right, I want to turn to, I guess, the other key issue that we want to focus on in this episode, coming out of the Labor Party uh, policy conference, and that is the question of climate policy. This really is one of the key issues for all political currents, like how you ident how you relate to this. Um, to the climate crisis, which undoubtedly is one of the biggest catastrophes that, um, you know, potential catastrophes that, that faces the human race. All political currents uh, are attested by that. Um, so I'll, I'm going to ask Sam if you make some comments about how the Labor Party has, uh, has uh, responded to that test. But beforehand, I just want to show this little clip from the conference itself. Delegates, the world faces a climate emergency and the globe's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity. I'm joining you from Liverpool in magnificent Western Sydney, where Anthony Albanese and I have just announced Labor's latest policies, which will reduce emissions and create jobs. We've committed that a Labor government will introduce an electric car discount to make EVs more affordable for Australians and cut transport emissions. And of course, Labor has reiterated our commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. Okay, so turning to you, Sam, uh, what are your comments about the climate decisions that the Labor Party conference has made? Look, I think they reflect the fact that the Labor Party recognises that it has to be seen to be doing something uh, about climate, that there's a, an important section of its base um, understands that climate change is real, has, has some grasp of the seriousness of the threat and that something needs to be done. So on the one hand, the Labor Party needs to be seen to be Taking climate seriously, um, and certainly can't and certainly can't afford to identify with climate change deniers, you know, outright deniers in the way that um, the Liberal Party has often done, effectively. Um, but simultaneously, cannot call into question the the the, the impulse of the big Australian mining corporations to continue to expand Australia's exploitation of fossil fuel resources. So. It's, it's almost like we live in, there's, there's two sort of parallel universes. On the one hand, um, Australian politicians, um, including the Labor politicians, will talk about the need, we'll, we'll talk about ideas for reducing um, emissions produced in Australia from, 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 you know, from transport or stationary electricity production, for instance. 
some of which is good. I mean, they don't go far enough, but which are, you know, all good and well, such as, you know, transition to electric vehicles or whatever it may be. Um, and, and, and talk about the transition away from, you know, coal and sometimes even gas domestically, whereas that's still, you know, that's still hard for the Liberals to talk about. But of course, the big taboo, you know, the elephant in the room is Australia's export of coal and gas, uh, which of course is expanding, which is booming. Um, and if, 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 if the significant new reserves of coal and gas, which the Australian mining industry is planning to open up, are opened up, are exploited and are burnt anywhere in the world, then we have no hit, no, we have no chance in hell of meeting our climate reduction targets. And so that's, that's just, that, 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 that almost can't be talked about, you know? And so there's, it's, it, there's an utter absurdity in Australian politics. And so in Western Australia, for instance, you know, you have the McGowan government signing up to the, um, you know, net zero by 2050, which we know is, is, is not based on science. I mean, that's just sort of, you know, that's just never, never land, um, you know, if the whole world goes net zero by 2050, then then um, then, then we then we're buggered anyway in terms of um, li limit, limiting warming. But um, but the actual export of, of coal and gas um, to the rest of the world remains you know a, t a taboo topic. I mean it's a bit like ANZUS as well. You know uh, you know you're a, you're a traitor if you even if, if, to, to the nation if you even call, call those things into question. And that's I mean that's the problem we've got. Like here in Western Australia the the the, the 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 WA government has its foot flat on the floor of of, of more gas of gas gas exports and even just the processing of gas for exports, um, which entails significant CO two emissions in its own right. You know that's little that let alone the emissions that happen when the gas is burnt at its destination, um, have have caused WA's emissions to skyrocket and Australia's to increase. And in fact the the, the, the emissions caused by the CO2 produced in the, in the production of, 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 of gas for export has, has in, in WA, has, out, has basically undone the value of every single solar panel installed on every roof in Australia. And that, that's, just, that's just gas in Western Australia. So, I mean, it's, a, it's an utter, it, it, you know, it's really deck chairs on the Titanic stuff to sort of fart around, you know, talking about, you know, electric cars in Australia while you're act opening the throttle to, 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 to coal and gas exports in the rest of the world, you know? I mean, the survival of, you know, human civilization and, and life on earth as we know it, you know, depends on the rest of the world just not buying the stuff from us, you know? Um, so it's kind of, you know, Australian, the Australian establishment kind of operates in this, in this sort of weird kind of moral universe where it's sort of, yes, climate change is real, um, but we have some special leave pass that entitles us to continue to export increasing amounts of coal and gas and somehow the rest of the world has just got to take care of the problem that's i mean that essentially is the bipartisan climate policy of labor and liberal the uh i mean obviously the electric vehicle subsidies is a, a kind of a policy that uh you know, I mean, obviously, it would be I mean, it's, it obviously it would be a good thing if there was more electric vehicle use, but uh, it still has a feature of promoting individual consumption. A lot of the about half of the em total emissions from electric from cars come in the actual manufacture process. So, even with an electric vehicle has got zero emissions during the driving of it, half of the um, you know the embedded emissions are going to contribute. You're going to represent half of the emissions of your of a car over its lifetime. Um, and, you know, it, this is once again avoiding the issue of public transport. Do you have any comments about that, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, the, 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 like, uh, notwithstanding everything I just said before about the fact that we're exporting <laughs> emissions to the rest of the world, um, yes, we still do need to take our domestic emissions seriously. And transport is the biggest, um, is the fastest rising component of our, of our emissions. Um, and, you know, we already have the technology to stop uh, transport emissions. Um, in terms of for the movement of people, it's public transport and bicycles. Um, we've had we've had the we've had the technology for for, for over a hundred years. You know, um, so you're quite right. The I mean, the the idea that um, we just need to change over the internal combustion engine for an electric engine, but we can still be still create car dependent cities is complete madness. Um, not just for an emissions, you know, reasons, but for a whole bunch of other reasons as well, you know? So, I mean, that's, 
you know, talking about the, the recent WA state election, uh, you know, a defi another defining characteristic of the McGowan government is this absolute commitment to what I call freeway madness, just the, the endless construction of new, of, of new freeways um, and sustaining the, 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 on, the onward march of Perth's urban sprawl. I mean, Perth is now one of the biggest cities in the world by surface area. Um, and I mean, that has, has a whole bunch of, of, of climate consequences as well in terms of, you know, clearing of remnant bushland and, 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 and other things. So, you know, we, we have the technology, it's investment in public transport um, for, for the movement of people. Uh, public transport, which, you know, so, you know, light rail and heavy rail, you know, um, with, with lots of, you know, nodes connecting it for, you know, people on bicycles, all that kind of thing. Of course, in terms of elect electric technology, the, the electric bikes are the real game changer in actual fact, you know, because they just mean that you don't have to be a particularly fit cyclist to be able to ride at 30 k's an hour and, and to do, you know, six, seven, eight, 10 kilometre journeys. So that if you want the real sort of game changer technology is that. Um, so that no, that's particularly frustrating. And so here in Perth, for instance, the Labor government is does have a reasonably significant um, rail um, capital expenditure program, but nearly all of the rail projects they're doing involve extensions of the existing rail network um, with sort of you know ex, uh, with, with with new stations surrounded by huge park and rides. You know, so the idea is that people will still drive from out of suburbia to these stations and get, get on the train and then go into the city, you know. So it's still a totally unsustainable model. And what we're not seeing um, is any any investment in new public transport infrastructure within the existing footprint, the existing urban footprint, you know, that would actually enable, um, you know, enable um, greater density, um, you know, as a counter urban sprawl. But if you're going to, if you're going to make our cities more dense, um, then one, you've got to do it well so that, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with, li with living in, in apartments, providing they've got, you know, parkland around them, that kind of thing. But also you need to, you need to be able to invest in the public transport as well. So, I mean, this is a real dilemma, putting on my hat as a city of Fremantle council. I mean, city of Fremantle has been relatively open to, to new sort of density. Um, I mean, there's, a, you know, there's lots of debate about what, you know, what is density well done and how high is too high for apartment buildings. And it's an endless kind of thing, you know, but we've seen that happen in Fremantle. Um, and, you know, um, lo local residents don't like it when they get any new density, you know, in, you know, inserted into their neighbourhood, no matter how well you do it or, or whatever, you know. Um, and really, it's got pretty frustrating. You know, the city of Fremantle has been fairly open to, you know, density well done, so to speak, um, but just not been rewarded by investment in public transport. In fact, for people who are familiar with Perth, there's, there's just been no, there's, there are no significant new public tr transport uh, projects for the for anywhere south of the river and west of the Kunana Freeway, which is essentially, you know, one third of the existing urban footprint of Perth. And of course, if, if, if the state government doesn't do that, then people are going to resist, you know, people in the existing suburbs are going to resist density being put into there, you know, but if, if, there's, if there's no trade off, there's, if there's no new sports facilities or new public transport, then people are going to actually resist, you know, um, apartments, no matter how nicely done, being inserted into their neighbourhood. And actually, that ends up just fueling the fueling the suburban sprawl. No, it's a totally totally dysfunctional um, sort of transport uh, pattern that we've got happening. And I'm sure it's much the same in other cities uh, around Australia. So that's that's a real problem. And um, the same could be said about investment in in, in uh, rail freight as well. And just briefly, I and mean, I think it's I think it's worth uh, highlighting and and uh, just just quickly get some comments. I mean, the fact that this policy platform has got no 2030 targets, whereas Labor parties took 2030 targets to the 2019 election, perhaps not good enough ones, but at least they had targets. This time there's nothing. Your comments about that? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that really shows it's all just been pushed off, pushed off to the never-never, you know? So you, 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 make your, you make your very distant target more grand and, you, and, you, and, your, um, and your closer one, you, you water that down. That's what they're doing. And of course, if we're actually to stop stop runaway global warming we need to do the hard work now you know um you know by 2050 we, we just want to be mopping up the little the, the, the little bits and pieces you know what, what's important is what we do in the next 5 10 15 years um so the 2030 targets actually need to be the bolder ones you know um that's that's the point and i mean certainly i you know um if you were to actually take the seriousness of of, of the climate crisis as it is then you know we 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 should be aiming to be net zero emissions in in within ten years, and that that you know that that would mean a you know a wartime style reorientation of our economy. But but it's still doable, you know. 
um, scientists and people who know more about it, planning energy networks and transport networks and all that kind of thing have, have, have demonstrated that's possible. Um, and we should certainly, you know, even if we fall a little bit short, that's, <laughs> that, that's a lot better than leaving it to 2050, which is just, I mean, these 2050 targets are just ludicrous. You know, they assume that what somehow in the last 18 months, we're going to do all the hard, you know, in, in, in late 2040, you know, <laughs> somehow in 2048, we we're going to do all the hard work. I mean, this is just, it's just an excuse for, to, 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 conti to continue on polluting regardless, basically. And uh, finally, before we finish up, I'm going to just play this, this extra clip from the conference as well. Only Labor in government will make Australia a renewable energy and manufacturing superpower, creating jobs and cutting energy prices, as well as reducing emissions. As we all know, Labor is the party of the environment. We're the only party in the country that has both the capacity to form government and the will to put conservation at the heart of what we do once we get there. One of the really important reasons why we need to elect an Albanese Labor government is to continue to build on this legacy in environmental protection and to also show leadership on water in this country. So, Sam, I'm wondering if you can respond to this contention that only a Labor government can, uh, can ever bring in reform. Well, I think what that, what that misses is that the real motor force of social change has always been people power. It's always been mass movements mobilised in the community, um, on the streets, places of education and our workplace. That's, that's the motor force for social change. And, you know, Parliament really just acts as the, as the gatekeeper for that change. Now, of course, in particular times in history, certain politicians, good politicians, can be the can be can help galvanise that change. They can speak to it. They can help mobilise people. That kind of thing. But given what we're up against, given that we know the massive resistance of corporate Australia to the to the change we need, both environmentally and socially, um, we, we're going to need mass movements for, for for change. That that's that's that that's the that's the first thing. And sec the second thing is you don't you don't help achieve that change. You don't help catalyze that change by watering down what you think is possible or what you say is possible, and then just telling people, oh, that's why they just need to support the Labor Party. So, I mean, even though I don't, uh, there's a number of fronts where I don't think the Greens policies go go far enough either. Um, the notion that somehow um, by voting for, for for Greens or Socialist Alliance or some other candidate that, that, that it's got better policies at the Labor Party that you're somehow endangering um, the possibility that we get anything good out of a Labor government. It just is, 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 is absolute nonsense. The very, the very opposite is true. Um, you should go out there and fight for what you want. You don't compromise. You don't, you don't compromise and sell that off in advance, you know. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Sam. And also thanks to Vivian as well. Before we do finish up, I do want to emphasise that even though we've been very critical of the Labor Party in this episode, rightly so, uh, obviously, this is not a case of supporting the Morrison government or the Liberal National Party. Uh, we and the left uh, need to actually build a progressive alternative to both Labor and Liberal. Uh, we would undoubtedly prefer to have a Labor government than a Liberal government. Uh, but at the same time, what the Labor Party is offering is not good enough. And we need to have a progressive left-wing alternative. And that's why uh, we would encourage you to support this, uh, this project, the Green F project. Uh, to because that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to build that alternative. Uh, there are ways that you can help. The most important way is you can actually become a supporter of Greenft. There's a link in the description for how you can you know, make a monthly contribution starting from $5 a month. Uh, you'll get the Greenft as part of that. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the most important way that you can support our project. But even without spending a single cent, you can give this a thumbs up wherever you're watching this video or listening to this podcast. Please share the link. Uh, please tell your friends about it. Please, uh, please invite other people to, um, to, to come along and be part of this project as well.